Let us start by proving this uh, nice uh, theorem or property of real numbers that every finite set of real numbers has a maximal element. In fact, it also follows that uh, every finite set of real numbers has also a minimal element. And of course, it is true for finite sets and it's untrue for infinite sets. For example, the set of all real numbers has no maximal element as there is no biggest real number. For every real number, we can find uh, a real number that is even bigger. Even for the set of natural numbers, there is no maximal element. This, this set is infinite. And so for every natural number, we can take its successor, n plus 1. So for every even natural number, we can find a natural number that, that is bigger than this. Okay? So this, this property is quite useful for finite sets. And the fact that we can compare real numbers is because we have this order relation that we know which uh, number is bigger. We can compare them. And in a sense, uh, if we look at the real numbers as a field, which is complete and has this order property, then there is a theorem, we will not go into it, it's a deep theorem that says that every complete, uh, we will elaborate later what it means to be complete, every complete field that, that is also ordered is in essence has to be the same as the real numbers. This is just as a side remark. So let us now prove this theorem. So we're going to prove this by induction. Induction is indispensable and very useful to, to proving theorems. And in fact, induction stands behind every deep argument in mathematics, as I think this quote is attributed to Paul Erdős. And in fact, induction lines are the foundations of mathematics. Okay, so let us now uh, prove this. Okay, so we prove by induction. So if we have a set that consists of a single element, then this element is the maximal element of the set. And by the way, when we say uh, maximal element, this means this is an element of the set itself. So in this case, when we have a set of one element, this element is a member of the set, it belongs to the set, and it is in fact the maximal element, element and also the, the minimal element. Now suppose that, here is the induction hypothesis, we suppose that for every finite set of real numbers of size at most n, there exists a maximal element and then we need to prove it for a set of size n plus 1, which is also finite. Okay, So uh, let us choose the set A, which consists of n plus 1 elements, so we can uh, label them and call them A1 up to A n plus 1. So now by the induction hypothesis, if we look at this subset of n elements, call it A prime, then by the induction hypothesis, this set has uh, a maximal element. Okay? So let's call this element M prime, and in fact, M prime, still by the induction hypothesis, is an element of uh, A prime. It's one of those A's, but I didn't want to choose a specific element here. We needed to give him a name, let's call it M prime, and remember that this is the maximal element of, uh, sorry, this is supposed to be A prime, and uh, M is one of those elements here. So we have that, uh, still it's the hypothesis that uh, M prime belongs to A prime. And now we need to prove that this set A has a maximal element. So now it's a matter of construction. We need to show that we can find an element in A that is greater or equal to all the remaining elements in the set. Okay, so uh, still, the induction hypothesis about M prime says that M prime is the maximal element of A prime. That is, it's an element, it's one of those. And for every element here, M prime is greater or equal than A i for i that is between 1 and n. Okay, so, so far so good, hopefully. And now we define this uh, M. Okay, so how we define M? M would be the maximum of the uh, set of size n plus 1. So we define to be M prime if m prime is bigger than a n plus 1, then this would be the maximal element. This would be, uh, in fact, maximum. And because a m prime belongs, belongs to a prime, which is a subset of a, and otherwise this element a n plus 1, which is an element of a, if it is bigger than m prime, then this has to be the maximal element of the set a. And this is it. So now, by means of construction, since we defined m to be the maximum between those two, then m is bigger or equal to a n plus 1. And uh, again, by this definition, m is bigger or equal than m prime. And m prime is bigger than a i for all i from 1 to n. This is from the uh, induction hypothesis. 
And so we have that this m is bigger than this element m prime, which is bigger of all the ai's from 1 to n, and m prime is bigger or equal than a n plus 1, therefore m prime is it's either m or uh, a n plus 1. m is an element of a prime, and a n plus 1 is an element of a, so in any event we, ha we have that this m has to be an element of a, it's one, one of the elements that is listed in a, and it's therefore the maximal element, because for every element of a we have that m is greater on or equal to that. Okay, and so now uh, we've basically proved it. So now we have a corollary which says that every finite set has a minimal element. Now in fact we could have used the previous proof and in both steps we have could have constructed the minimal uh, element and the maximal element, and so I'm separating this proof and singling out just for pedagogical reasons because I want to show another nice trick which could be useful. So we will actually use the property that every finite set has a maximal element to show that uh, every finite set has to have a minimal element, just a nice trick that I wanted to show, and this is the reason that I'm setting, separating this proof uh, from the previous one because we could have proved it even in the previous step. So let's see how, how it's done. So we take this set A, which is which has an elements. It's it's a finite, so we can list all of its elements. It's a one up to a n. And uh, okay, so and we consider this set minus a. It's a common notation in mathematics, and basically we look at the set with minus of all those elements. And so here is here is an important thing. We say that without loss of generality, we can we we will assume that minus a one is the maximal element of the set which I denoted by minus a. And why do we have this maximal element? Because, of we, uh, because we have already proved that every finite set has a maximal element. And so let, let, it, let me say a few words about what it means to, to say without loss of generality. Basically when we say without loss of generality is that we are assuming that we are in some special case, we are making some assumption, but in fact, claiming that this is uh, reasoning according to this assumption, improving the theorem under this assumption, is actually just uh, equivalent to proving it in, in the general case. And basically, we need like to say a few words why it does not uh, uh, limit the generality, or why we're not losing any generality. Because if a one minus a one wasn't the maximal element of this set, which I called minus a then we can always renumber the elements so that this a1 would be the, ma the maximal element of minus a. So if we wish we could have enumerated this. And so it could have just started that uh, with a situation that minus, one, minus a1 is the maximal element of minus a which is guaranteed to exist, but if it wasn't we just could have picked the maximal element, uh, call it uh, just a1, my, minus a1, and then uh, we call the other elements by whatever names that we wish. So now uh, uh, this means that for every j we have that minus a j is smaller or equal to minus a, because uh, because th that's the assumption that minus a is the maximal uh, minus a one is the maximal element of this set. So now if we take this equality and multiply it by minus one, right? then we have to reverse the direction of the inequality here. So this is equivalent to saying that minus, uh, that a1 is smaller or equal than a j for every j, but this means that a1 is the minimal element of a. So using this assumption, right, uh, on the, using the theorem that every finite set has a maximal uh, element, we have used it to prove that every finite set also has to have a minimal element. And so, of course, uh, yeah, this is this concludes the proof. So, of course, the induction hypothesis is a very powerful and very useful tool that lies at the foundation of mathematics, but it must be used with caution. And let me give you an example according to George Polya, which shows that it is really sometimes can be really subtle of proving something by induction. We have to be very careful. So, uh, let's let's consider this example. So, I'm going to prove the following theorem of course, in double quotes, it's not a theorem, I'm going to prove by induction that all the horses are of the same color. This is the example that was originally proposed by George Polya 
to show that proving by induction, you know, we have to be careful. So let us prove this by induction on the size of the set of the horses. So basically the induction steps goes as follows. So the base case, so if we have a set of size one, right, for all sets of horses of size one, that is sets that contain only one horse, then, you know, by definition, all the horses in the set are of the same color. Okay, so nothing surprising here. And here is the induction hypothesis. So now suppose that for all sets of size less or equal to n, so let's name the horses by h1 up to hn, the horses are all of the same color, okay? For, for some n, we, that, that's the induction hypothesis, and of course we may assume this. And we need to take the step, we basically need to prove that for every set of n plus 1 horses, uh, they're also of the same color, okay? So the induction step, uh, let us pick a, a, a set of n plus 1 horses, and we have the set of horses which goes from h1 up to hn, and here we have hn plus 1, and those are the horses. And so now we apply the induction hypothesis, and we, uh, we conclude that all the horses in this set are of the same color. But what about this hn plus 1? So now what I would do is that I will extract one horse, one of those, it doesn't matter which, so I will extract this hn horse and replace him by this horse hn plus 1. Okay? So we remove hn and uh, replace it by hn plus 1, and so we have this set of n horses again, right? We have n horses, and again by the induction hypothesis we conclude that all the horses in this set, uh, which is of size n, by induction hypothesis, they are of the same color, right? So we apply the induction hypothesis, concluded that all the horses here are of the same color, but the horse hn that we have extracted is also of the same color as those, uh, so it means that all those horses h1 up to hn are of the same color, and then they are also of the same color as hn plus 1, right? So it basically concludes the proof that all the horses are um, of the same color. Now, of course, this is complete nonsense, and uh, this, this example exaggerates that, uh, you know, we, we can prove, if we're not careful, we can cr prove something uh, which doesn't make any sense, and it's quite hard to spot the mistake. Where, where did I cheat? Where did I lie in, in this proof? Where is the fallacy here? So if you want, just uh, you can pause the video and think about it for a few moments before I reveal where is the mistake. It's really not that easy to find, it's quite subtle. So um, if you're ready, 3, 2, 1. So let's find where is the mistake here. So uh, let us consider what we did so far. So uh, we've proved it by induction on the size of the set, and of course the base case is true, right? Uh, the base case is, is, is true. Uh, for all uh, sets of horses of size n, uh, of size 1, they're all of the same color. Nothing surprising here. And so we suppose that for horses of size n, this, this is true. And then we started with the induction step. And so up to this point, everything is fine. And this is invoking the induction hypothesis. So here's the problem. When we remove this horse hn from this set of h1 up to hn, right, and we replace it by the other horse, this is where we encounter the problem, because at no stage here, at no step, do we, we verify that we're left with this set which is not empty. We didn't verify this, and this is where the failure happens, because uh, if we examine the proof, then we see that the transition, even from a case of one horse uh, to two horses, is impossible, as expected, because we know that we can have two horses of different color, right? And so if we have this, uh, so let us imagine uh, the transition between uh, this base case um, of set that contains only one horse uh, and try to prove it to generalize this to two horses. So we have this set with one horse and then we add another one together, right? And then, okay, we say in the set of one, all the horses are of the same color. Now we remove this horse and add the other one inside. So this is where the problem, once we remove this original horse, we're left with an empty set. And so even the transition from one horse to two horses is impossible. And so since we didn't verify here that this 
set is not empty, this is where the fallacy occur occurs, and here's here's the place that we make this crucial mistake, and then we prove uh, something which is a complete nonsense. Okay, and so note that this uh, proof is of different color; it's not a green proof that I use. So it's proof; it, it's not proof; it's just a, you know just an argument with 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 a mistake. Okay, so hopefully it was useful, and next time when you'll be using induction, you'll be using it with caution.